So my name is Lee Rauch. I am a PhD student at the University of Miami. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'll pass it to Scott to introduce himself. Hey everybody, Scott Evans, also University of Miami, uh, United States, um, associate professor in our School of Education and Human Development. Uh, pronouns he, him, his. Great. Um, I don't know if we wanna do quick introductions, Scott, or just use the chat function. I think we're small enough. Do folks mind just doing a quick uh, hello and check in so we can maybe hear your voice and potentially see your face if it works for you? Others, although numbers seem to be growing here. Uh, hi, I'll, I'll say, uh, Tristan, I'm the host uh, for the session. So I'm only tech, tech uh, support at the moment at Victoria University in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Anybody else can introduce themselves or just introduce yourselves in the chat, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Yeah, you know, my, my name's Rama, um, he, him pronouns, and I'm at Victoria University in Australia as well. Great. Uh, my name's Roshani, um, same as Rama from Victoria University, Australia. Hi, I'm Gina Langhout, I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm at University of California at Santa Cruz. I... Hey, oh, sorry. <laughs> you go. Um, hey, I'm Daniel. Uh, he, him, his, um, or pronouns. Um, yeah, I finished at Victoria University a couple of years ago. Um, my first international conference. It's been really uh, wonderful so far. So, yeah, nice to meet you all. Interesting first international conference. <laughs> but, um, I'm Amy Quayle at BU as well. Maybe Wes, uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry, might have interrupted somebody, but maybe we'll ask the rest of the folks just to drop their quick intros and, and preferred pronouns in the chat. Um, and then we can, time is short, so we'll kind of move it along. Thanks, back to you, Lee. Great. Yeah, so thanks for being here, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. Um, we just wanted to start off really sort of quickly with a land acknowledgement. Um, we're just gonna acknowledge the land of where we are in, in Miami um, and just acknowledge that we live and work um, on the ancestral land of the Chiquesa people, the Seminole people, the Mississippi people, and the Miami people. Um, and we just acknowledge that naming this is, you know, just merely the beginning steps to pay our respects to the members of these communities, both past and present, and to honor the larger truth telling and reconciliation efforts, um, while recognizing the effects of colonization on the people who lived here for centuries before. And we just encourage you to, um, if you don't know already, to look up the land that you're on and to just, um, you know, acknowledge maybe the place where you're at right now. So um, today we wanted to have a conversation about anti-racism and what that means for us as researchers, as community members, community partners, as we build relationships to do the work that we do. Um, just to sort of start the conversation, we'll share just a little bit about our own experience with anti-racism and committing to that work and what it means for us to build an anti-racist practice. Sort of a disclaimer, I think both of us are in the early infancy stages of building our own anti-racist practice and you know, certainly are not the experts. And so we're really just happy to have this space with you all today to learn from each other, learn what you all are doing um, and just talk about what it means to have an anti-racist practice, what that looks like um, and how can we help each other to build that to improve the work that we do with our community. So, for us and for me, um, I'm currently working on my dissertation and have been working with an organization in Miami for the past two years called Power U. They're a Black-led youth organizing group here in Miami, and they focus on dismantling the school-to-prison pipeline and really work on organizing Black and Brown working-class young people in Miami to, um, you know, change the conditions of their education, of their communities, and 
as I began working with them and an interest to do work with them, not just because of my dissertation, but because I was really interested and committed to the work that they're doing, um, you know, I started to think about what does it mean for me to be a white person in this space with these young people and with these organizers who are black and marginalized and people of color and, you know, realizing that I haven't hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about my own whiteness and what it means to be white, especially to be a white researcher who, you know, brings with me a lot of history of harm that white researchers have caused on marginalized communities. So, um, you know, really started looking for how do I do this work in a way that's that is, you know, mitigating harm as best as I can. And that wasn't really being talked about in my core community psychology classes. And so I started looking for readings and resources outside of my coursework and um, took a training on anti-racism from a black woman in Miami who does a lot of trainings around anti-racist work and what it means to have an anti-racist practice and really just began learning from her and from that training um, what that means and what that looks like. And so, you know, for me, that means a lot of personal reflection, building in that personal reflection into my dissertation, asking myself constantly what how am I showing up in this space? What does solidarity mean? How can I be in solidarity with this organization and with other community partners? Um, working with a local showing up for racial, racial justice group where you know myself and other white and white passing folks talk about whiteness and what that means and unpacking our own biases, paying attention to who I cite in my dissertation and uh, other works of publications and conference work that I do, um, you know, trying to redistribute financial resources when I really benefit from a person of color's work and when it really helps um, just shape my own learning and trying to pay them for their time and their labor and compensate them in that way. So those are just a few things that I've started doing, um, you know, very basic things, but I think really important things to be doing. And so really just excited to share ideas, share what it means to be building this anti-racist practice, what that looks like for all of us and how we can support each other in building this work. Um, and I'll give Scott a little bit of space to talk about what we've done on the team, on our research team. And so. Thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, and I think um, too recently I've had to really come to grips with um, how I, in my own graduate studies years ago, I wasn't really forced at any point to um, uh, to come to grips with my own privilege. And I think um, partially due to some gaps in, in my graduate program, um, but also just a, a lot of blind spots that I was working with. And that you know comes with all the privilege that uh, I, I have just being a white male. Um, and, you know, truly I've been, uh, forced to and challenged uh, in a great way by, by my community partners and, and also the students that I work with, Lee being one of them, to, um, to really change the way we uh, do our research team uh, meetings in general and the way we approach our community work. Um, and some of that involved, like Lee said, bringing in some outside folks to um, help us kind of wrestle with um, uh, some Things that we haven't really looked at in detail, and 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 also acknowledging that we're uh, kind of embedded in an institution that's um, certainly uh, kind of grounded in kind of white supremacist culture, um, and so bringing a lot of those things to the foreground has uh, been really important. Uh, and I just saw Natalie pop in. Natalie was on my research team uh, before she uh, retreated back to uh, to to Canada, um, and she was really involved in kind of getting a lot of that started we were using the research team space to uh, examine a lot of our own assumptions, our own biases, and certainly our own privilege. Um, but this more recent work with, with Power U that Lee is reverting to, uh, referring to, um, is, has really uh, helped us um, kind of approach this uh, in a way that is more focused on kind of anti-racism, anti-racist practice. And so, like Lee said, hoping we can um, you know, uh, acknowledge that we're, um, we're at least I'll speak for myself. I'm still uh, kind of learning how to how to be better and how to do this um, this work and really commit to this type of practice. Um, and we kind of wanted to put ourselves out there in this in this conference with you guys in this session uh, to see if we could uh, have an honest dialogue about um, uh, the benefits and challenges of 
of coming face to face with privilege in the context of our work in communities. We'll pass it back to Lee. Great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that extra bit of information, Scott. So yeah, before we jump into a conversation together, I just want to um, establish some group norms. You know, these conversations are difficult and um, really challenging. And so we just want to make sure we're entering into this conversation sort of all at the same baseline and understanding. Um, so some norms that I've put together that I think can help guard, guide our conversation today are welcoming multiple viewpoints, especially at an international conference. We're all coming from all over the world, which is um, such an amazing space to be a part of. Owning your intentions and your impact, working to recognize your privileges, taking risks by leaning into the discomfort of the conversation and stepping into your bravery, maybe sharing things that feel uncomfortable, but um, that can contribute to the learning environment, making space and taking space, uh, name and noticing and naming group dynamics in the moment. Um, this is a learning environment. And so naming those, those dynamics in the moment really helps us to, to learn together, actively listening to one another and challenging with care, you know. Um, this is again, a challenging and difficult conversation, but I think we can be in the space to challenge each other and to push each other. Um, but that's the norms that I came up with. Is there any other group norms that others wanna add or name? Um, and you can drop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and just add to the collective group norms. Okay. Hearing none. <laughs> um, so I think we're a big enough group that we'll just, uh, maybe divide off into two small breakout rooms and just have a conversation. Um, I have some questions to to guide the small group, but of course, you know, we can feel free to talk about this this topic and with anything that comes up for you. But um, some questions that I've put together are: What does anti-racism mean to you? What does a commitment to an anti-racist practice mean for you? And how would a commitment to an anti-racist racism or an anti-racist practice impact your research and community partnerships? Um, I also put together a jam board, <laughs> which is just a way where you can um, basically like write down on little sticky notes, your responses that you talk about in your groups. I find that sometimes when we come back to a large group, it's like, what did we talk about? I don't know what to report back. So um, this is a great way to just capture people's responses, just to um, hear what we all have to say. And um, Basically at the top of the Jamboard, there is the different frames that have the different questions. And then off to the side, you can drag and drop a new sticky note and you can edit the sticky note and just add things. The sticky notes are anonymous, so they won't have your name attached to them, but um, feel free to add what you talk about in your groups. So, so, so Lee, I've made Scott host, unless he wants to revert that back to me, uh, then I can coordinate the breakout rooms. Um, otherwise, Scott, you're in the driving seat. You're recording, you're doing the whole lot. <laughs> I have control. I'm going to yeah. do three groups. That's okay, Lee, because it looks like we got about 20 or so folks. So give us right. a little bit more breathing room. And how many minutes did you say? Um, about 20 minutes. Okay. And I'll, I'll post the, well, the questions are on the GM board, but we'll drop them into the uh, breakout room chat as well. Yeah. Um, and ready? Go. <laughs> Going. Hey, Lester, are you there? Can you hear me? Hey, Lester, if you can hear me, we're, uh, we're in small groups. You should have a option to join a, a breakout room on your screen if you if you're able to see it.
Hi, I was in room one. I think I was turned off because of my son. I don't know if I could come back.
<laughs> Still just us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, no, we found some other people. It's not just us anymore. <laughs> I don't know if you guys experience when you teach classes and you when you close the breakout rooms, it gives you 60 seconds, but students automatically leave. They're like, we're gone. <laughs> we waited like half. We said our goodbyes and then out of there. We also had multiple babies in our session, which was really lovely. One is, still, one, one is still there. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully with adult supervision, they're not just there by them by themselves hanging out. Just talking about their anti-racist <laughs> practice. <laughs> That's totally a session I would join. <laughs> yeah, mine, mine's going to be joining in a second, and I swear she looks like she's ready for college, so she'll probably come and contribute to the conversation, even though she can only say daddy. All right, well, I think we have most people back. Um, so I'm just you know, I guess report back on what you talked about in your small groups, what was generative, what was helpful, um, what came up for you all in your conversations. I'm really curious to hear. Don't all share at once. Oh, all right. <laughs> Liz hates a Zoom silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was in the babies group. <laughs> and um, we talked about a lot of things, but we did talk about the fact that um, we, many of us have found it tricky in the organizations that we work in because they're kind of happy to to, to talk about anti-racist or anti-oppressive practice um, in relation to the external world um, and in the community and that sort of terminology is is viewed as absolutely appropriate in that setting but um, suggesting that there is a level of internal uh, racial inequity is much, much, much more difficult. So they can support what you're doing externally, but if you want to turn the mirror, a lot of resistance. I think I really resonate with that. Um just even being a grad student, you know, I feel like this work externally is, you know, really supported by community partners and um, by other relationships with other community members that I've built. But um, once the conversation sort of comes internally into, you know, our own program or even thinking about SCRA as an organization, um, there definitely seems to be a lot more resistance to having that conversation or implicating ourselves in, um, you know, in racist practices or oppressive practices. So I certainly resonate with that. We also, in the, I was also in the same group. Um, we also just spoke about the, the emotional work that would be needed to do this and how it wouldn't be easy and how we've seen in different spaces when it works and when it doesn't work because it brings up so many emotions and uh, white fragility or you know any one of these dynamics that we tend to prefer leaving under the surface so how do we do this in such a way that we don't other like or that we don't that people don't feel judged and that they feel rather on the contrary healed and held um in the work of moving towards um, anti-racist dynamics.
Yeah, I think that's a good point, and I'd like to speak to that. Um, I've been, I have read in the past some of Zeus Leonardo's work, and he talks about um, kind of the technology of emotion for white folks and how as whites we tend to bifurcate um, whiteness into the good whites and the bad whites. So I find it useful, at least in my community psychology classes and in activist settings I'm in and other spaces too, to talk about how um, like there's, this isn't about good and bad, um, but it's about like if, if we've messed up and somebody's calling us in, that's an act of love and to try to hold it that way. And like that person wouldn't have raised it if they didn't think that I was capable of change. And so that's the way that I personally have worked to get through my own defensiveness around that issue. Um, and I think it's useful to just have open conversations about that and to hear, I guess from other white people, how we strategize like staying present and showing up again after we've messed up and um, yeah, seeing things as a process and not ever perfect. Thanks for that, Gina. And I was telling my small group that I've, my biggest challenge has been kind of dealing with my own defensiveness and you know maybe thinking that I'm I'm one of the good whites right and then I get called in or called out I like well wait a minute um and so being really honest about um those moments and it's it is an emotional reaction that I feel um that it turns into defensiveness um and trying to kind of get past that and kind of step back into it has been my ongoing practice yeah, it's a it's a great point. Like we we so often talk about calling people out, or um, I like it, I like the way it's put. Like instead of confront, we care from, but we don't often talk about or reflect upon being called out. Um, yeah, it's just a that's just really sat with me. Then it's um it's it's half it's at least half of the picture, isn't it? If not more, um, we can't look at ourselves and, and accept any criticism, be it just or not. Um, the biggest hypocrites in the world and i say that as a white person being the biggest hypocrite and the most privileged person that could be we in our our group we didn't take any notes because we got really into our conversation so my apologies lee and scott um but one of the things that yeah yeah one of the things we were talking about one of the things that i brought up but then we had a nice conversation about was kind of breaking down white solidarity. So this idea that if someone does something that like you stay silent through those moments um, and the, 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 the ways in which the everyday ubiquitous nature of, of racism needing to just be a part of the conversation and needing to stand up and stand with our partners and not put the weight of, of, of that call out and call in on um, our racialized colleagues and friends and um, that that is part of the kind of action of being anti-racist and that when we claim you know as white people that that work is exhausting or it's too much or or whatever that might be like checking ourselves um about the risk the, the the smaller risk we take when we stand up against the kind of those everyday moments of how racism is manifesting in our workplaces or our communities Chris named it as Zoom silence. That uh, yeah, discomfort with Zoom silence. And here I go jumping right into it. Sorry. Thanks for posting that that link, Gina. All right, I'll jump in. I think um, something we talked about in our group that was interesting, um, somebody asked a question about like, 
naming it an anti-racist practice, does that then become sort of like this set of checklist things that we add to our practice and then like, oh, we're doing our practice because we're able to check them off or, um, and so, you know, thinking about what that means to um, one, incorporate an anti-racist practice into everyday life, our everyday life, not just, um, you know, with our work with communities or when we're in those particular spaces with our community partners, but doing that on an everyday basis. And then also making sure that um, it doesn't become a set of checklist items that we can say that we're quote unquote good because we're checking off the boxes, right? And um, it's something that's always evolving and making sure that it doesn't become something that's just like checking it off and then saying like, okay, I did my anti-racist practice for today, you know? So I thought that was interesting to think about um, just using this, this term practice, is it limiting in some way or does it um, perhaps lead to um, maybe not being as productive or something? I don't know. I'm sure you can get a, an app for that. You get like points and like rewards and things like that. Right? Yeah. A Disney subscription if you accrue enough points. Um, one of the other things we talked about in our group, and this was something that Kendi talks a lot about is um, you know, it's, it's easier to some degree to um, kind of notice and call out or call in um, kind of racist behaviors um, or even notice it in ourselves. And it's, you know, Kendi talks about the work of really trying to identify and call out uh, racist policies um, and, and looking at those structural uh, uh, norms that are kind of upholding um, racism um, and, and some of those are right under our nose and, and, and happening uh, in our own departments and our own programs, institutions, um, and really trying to uh, really witness those and, and identify those and try to challenge them. One example I give to students sometimes is like, you know, the university that I'm in has a um, endowment, right? So there's, there's a, a money that's being invested um, in places, right? So when you when you look at where those investments are, you know, some of those investments are going to private prisons. Some of those investments are going to uh, petroleum and oil companies, right? So there's, and there's a lot of ways that those investments are racist because they uphold a, a certain injustice in some way. So just an example of ways of trying to open the hood and look at some of the policies that are contributing to racial injustice and inequalities. I think another way that we can think about our institutions is that, you know, they're also very much the way that we think about um, accountability is at the individual level, which is all about whiteness too, right? So at UC Santa Cruz, I'm sure this is true at some other institutions as well. On the website, there's like this report hate bias button and you can click on it and you can report if somebody did something, but there's no way to report a policy or a practice. And so I've been talking with my institution about what would it mean to actually be able to report policies and practices. And when I first raised this a couple of years ago, I was told like, oh, we can't do that because we don't know how to like investigate that essentially or to remedy it. And so we have a new person in charge of that. So I've been talking with her and um, now they're working on trying to figure out like, what would that mean? And can we do it? So I'm hoping that we can have some forward momentum on this. And I'm- love that idea. I do love that idea, but I also need to jump in because um, I realized that we're over time actually a little bit. Um, so I hope this conversation continues in the rest of the sessions and um, that we can all talk again, but really appreciate everybody for the conversation today. And I hope you have a good rest of your conference. <laughs>